This episode is brought to you by Honeysuckle White. If you're looking for ways to make mealtime healthier in the new year, make your favorite recipes with turkey from Honeysuckle White. Take the pressure off. Keep it simple and tasty without sacrificing flavor for nutrition. Whether you want a delicious sandwich or post-workout protein, Honeysuckle White Turkey can do it all. Visit HoneysuckleWhite.com for recipe inspiration and to find retailers near you. Honeysuckle White. Eat what you love. Beer, wine, spirits, fashion, luxury, rocket ships, dinosaurs. All things that will never go out of style, which is why you need Drizzly, the go-to app for drink delivery. With Drizzly, you can shop a huge selection of beer, wine, and spirits from stores near you. Then get them delivered to your door. Skip the store run, stick to the catwalk. Download the Drizzly app or go to drizzly.com. That's D-R-I-Z-L-Y dot com today. Must be 21 plus, not available in all locations. Hello and welcome to The Paddock in the Pavilion with Stephen Wallace. In each show, Stephen will interview someone connected to the world of horse racing or cricket. Hello, James Hildreth of Hildreth Financial Management. That's right. Yeah. How do you go from scoring hundreds to looking at tax codes? <laughs> well, it wasn't a it wasn't a kind of stop one, start the other. It was. Uh, it's, it's been a transition that's happened. Probably over the last four or five years, I did some some private banking work and uh, in the winters when I played, I was always really conscious of when I played of realising that you have to have a second career. Maybe some of the youngsters now who get into cricket won't have that. Um, but I was always conscious that I needed to try and find another job after cricket and I wanted that transition to be as smooth as possible. So I, I did some work in the winters and we had some connections through Somerset did some work at a private bank, I buffed not Latham during the winters for four or five years while doing all my my exams. So yeah, it was um it was building up to it really. I couldn't officially start something until my cricket career finished, but it was a few years in the making before deciding to go out on my own. You never wanted to stay in the game and be a coach? I did, yeah. I mean I, I did all my coaching badges. Uh, I love love the sport, love cricket. It was just uh, I was just weighing lots of things up. In my head, I've I've saw saw coaches um, coming and going in different counties. That insecurity, and if new people came in and they wanted a new staff, then potentially have to uproot. I wanted to be a bit more in charge of my own kind of future, I suppose. And taking the gamble of setting up a business was something that could I could do. And um, it get it would hopefully it will give me the flexibility around doing my own diary and and watching the kids play their sport and and that. So there's a lot more to it than um, than just going out on my own. But there, there's lots of benefits. So yeah, but I you know I love cricket and I want to stay involved in the game and in sport in some some capacity in the future. Um, I probably won't be through coaching. I don't think that particularly floats my boat, but if it's getting involved on boards or in other capacities from a more commercial angle, then that's probably something I'd be open to. And what does your new career involve, your new job involve? So it's, it's financial planning, essentially. So I I look at what people want to achieve in their lives, really. It's, it's again, through sport, it's that goal setting bit, and that's sitting down and talking with people around what their goals are and that could be saving for a house it could be a lot of people want to retire early so you go through what their their goals are and then look at their current situation what they've got and see the shortfalls between the two really so help them trying to achieve those goals in the future and if that's retire early can we put strategies in place now which will enable that to happen so it's sitting down and taking that holistic view of someone's picture putting plan putting plans in place now that will enable them to to achieve their future goals that was one of my questions. So you you think there are some skills playing cricket that you can transfer to a new role in sort of setting targets and achieving different aims? Absolutely. And the goal setting is one, one element of it, but but the teamwork in terms of clients that are on board and feeling like it's, it's part of a team, um, all pushing forward into the same direction, we're all trying to achieve something. So there's lots of transferable skills and personal ones in terms of work ethic and um, wanting to be successful and be the best you can be, be the best wealth manager I can be. Those kind of innate skills are in me that will hopefully drive myself and, and the business forward really and help help clients. 
And are you coming up to a busy time with not that many weeks to the end of the tax year? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. The tax year ends huge, really. Just again, it's an awareness thing. Are people using their allowances? Um, is it something they're aware of that they have these allowances, what the allowances are and the benefits of using some, say it's pension contributions and the tax relief and and various bits and bobs around that. So, yeah, I mean, as as you would know from from your um, previous jobs, it's it's a big time of year to just try and get um you know that those kind of messages out there that people can can use allowances uh, to to help them on that path of, of achieving those goals that i talked about a minute ago was it the right time to retire it must have been hard i mean played 20 years for one county it's tough yeah i mean i like i said, absolutely loved loved the career uh love what it gave me and my family so yeah it was tough it's 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 still raw, I suppose. It feels like a lifetime ago that I played, but it was only September when when the season finished. Um, so it's uh, you know I'll, I'll I'll certainly miss it. I, I don't necessarily think I'll miss the the ups and downs of being a batter in professional cricket. I think that was that got quite tiring towards the end. But it was it was definitely the right time for me. Um, I knew before the the my final season started that I knew that that was going to be my final season I kind of made that decision and spoke to the coaches um and the management at Somerset before that that season started just to say look this is you know this is it for me this is this will be my last year um and then they can they can deal with um with that how how they want to but I was I was very clear in my my head that it was going to be my last year you're not missing the uh pre-season training then in the indoor school and the, and the bleep test and things like that at the moment no the first time in 20 years I don't have fat tests and bleep tests and all these different um medical screenings and everything so I don't miss that but what I do miss is saw the boys in town the other day and they were talking about their pre-season trip to Abu Dhabi they're going on in a in a you know in a month or something and I was thinking well oh, actually that was I'll miss that that was quite nice <laughs> just to go away you know paid holiday for for a couple of weeks so I'll, I'll miss that element of it uh, you certainly will if we get some beast from the east come back and we're freezing cold and they were out in Abu Dhabi weren't you yeah I mean it's slightly different you go out there and it's amazing because of obviously the weather and um your guaranteed sunshine but the conditions are very different so you go out there and it is extremes in the heat out there to coming back and playing pre-season games at Thornton Vale where you know, it could be raining and freezing cold. So it's um, it's good prep because you get on grass, but it's the, the conditions are certainly very different. Well, let's move on to your, your cricket career. You scored over 27,000 runs in all formats for, for Somerset, 54 centuries. But how did it all start? You were a very talented sportsman. Reading, you were good at hockey, tennis, squash, football. There's a connection with Luton Town. Why did you choose cricket? Uh, I think, I think I didn't. I don't. I'm not sure. I necessarily chose cricket. I think it almost chose me in a way. I went to Millfield School when I was ten years old. A school renowned for its sport and giving kids the opportunity to play many different sports. So that was amazing. So I went to school there when I was ten, and that I went there really predominantly to to play tennis initially. Although I went on, on kind of an all rounders sports scholarship. So it was. It, as soon as I got there, it opened my eyes to lots of different sports as well. So before that, I was playing South of England tennis, South of England squash, Luton Town football um, and cricket as well for, for North Ants. But when I got to Millfield, it opened up hockey, rugby. So in the end, I played multiple different sports and just loved sport, loved everything about it, was reasonably coordinated so I could get stuck into to lots of different sports um, and ended up you know, playing many. And then as, as time went on, really, sports started drifting away and cricket seemed to be the one that just progressed more more than others. I think when I went to Millfield, my football um, naturally kind of faded away a little bit, being a, a private school at the time. Um, but cricket was the one that just progressed. So I, I loved playing and loved cricket. But also, if you do well at the time, if you did well in a schoolboy cricket, there were there were scouts around and, and you get selected for the, the age group size. And it just seemed for me an easy, natural progression to keep working through through the ranks um, up until 18, really. So, yeah, I wouldn't say I necessarily chose it. It just seemed to seem to progress more than the other sports. Well, Somerset wise, you made your debut for the second eleven in 2002. I'll just come back to that in a second as well. 
your first Lebanon debut in 2003 and you got your cap in 2007. Um, and we're going to talk about a few of your major highlights over that two decade career. But I looked up your debut for the second level and you, and you were a substitute. And I noticed you actually bowled 13 overs for 82 against Warwickshire and Warwickshire got 680 for nine. They did, yeah. Did you see you got the two double hundreds? Yeah, I see that um, uh, Trevor Penny and Jonathan Trott both got, well, one got 255 and Jonathan Trott got 245. <laughs> they must have liked your bowling. And Nolan Dorridge. Yeah, it was, uh, I think they liked everyone's bowling that day. Yeah, that was, um, yeah, I, I, I got called up to that game because uh, Peter Trigo got called up to the first team. I think they were playing the West Indies or something at, at Taunton. So, I think I was halfway through. It was halfway through the game when I got the call to go and play in the the second team, and uh, yeah, it was um, yeah, it was kind of a bit of an awakening going there and bowling and just seeing Trotty and Trevor Penny just smashing it, smashing it everywhere on a small small ground with a flat wicket. But it was um, yeah, it was interesting. I think it was one of those that you go from schoolboy cricket to then seeing what what proper cricket's like, really. And your first. First class century came in your second first class match against Durham, where you faced up to Shoab Akhtar, probably the fastest bowler in the world at the time. That must have been a been a test on your second match for Somerset. Yeah, when I reflect on it, it's, at the time I I was um, you know I was quite a cheeky chappy when I was younger, and at the time I was completely fearless. I it just did not. It probably affected me less then than it would have done five or ten years later. Thinking if I had to face him, I, I honestly, I just thought I've got nothing to lose, um, and I really want to see. I just remember thinking, I really want to. He's the quickest bowler in the world by all accounts. I really want to see what that feels like. So I want to go and stand there and see how quick that is, and if it is ridiculously quick or if it is manageable. Um, and I went out there, and it was ridiculously quick. So I, uh, so I'm, yeah, facing him and. You know he's running up from the boundary, and he 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 bowled quick, but it was amazing. I absolutely loved it, and just and and got some runs of second innings as well because I just thought I'm you know this is great. I'm facing the quickest bowler in the world. He might not have been, even been bowling. I don't know what paces he, it felt quick that day, but to me it was like well I've just faced the quickest bowler in the world, and I've got through it. So I was so pleased I went through that experience early on in my career because it gave me so much confidence to think, well, I've got 100 against what everyone's saying is the quickest bowler in the world. So if no one can get any quicker than that, then I'm comfortable with that. So going into all the future games, I was thinking, well, I've done that. That's, so it was it was huge. It was huge for me. Um, chucked into there. Someone got injured, went to have, have to go and play in the game. But for me, it was, I think, if if young players can go through an experience like that early on, it just stands them in such good stead for the for the rest of their careers. You scored 101 off 113 balls and 72 in the second innings. Did he turn out after all those years to be the fastest bowler you faced? I think, yeah, I think those the spells that I faced during that game, uh, and it was a kind of nose and toes um can't, what I had to face really during that day when he was running in and and that felt it felt rapid it felt quick and he was obviously intimidating because of his extraordinarily long run up so he'd just run up from from miles back and he would either try and hit you in the head or in the toes and you know snarl at you and get angry and set strange field placings and um because I was young just went hard at me so I think that was it was uncomfortable but I was 19 years old I didn't really care as well it was just oh this is quite funny I and I just remember thinking I love the fact that he's getting wound up bowling at me like I just think I'm an absolute nobody standing here and he's running in this absolute legend of cricket fast fastest bowling in the world and I am making him angry and I was I was enjoying the fact that he was getting angry thinking this is a this is madness how this how this young little lad Somerset from Somerset is um is making the fastest bowler in the world angry. And I love that. So I'd, you know, I'd happily kind of wind him up a bit, which I tend to be quite good at sometimes. A year later was a big year for you because Somerset won the, the blast competition, beating Lancashire in the final by seven wickets. And you helped, well, you got 16 not out. You helped Graham Smith, the captain, steer the, the team home. 
Yeah, great, a great day. And I think I've said a few times really that uh, that that kind of 2020 tournament was was not really a surprise to me, which coming from uh, the school I did, we were used to winning and just felt like winning was quite a natural, natural state. So actually early on in my career to win a domestic trophy was such an amazing experience, but I didn't think that it would take so long to win another one. At the time I thought, great, we've won a trophy. Um, why can't we just go on and win another one? Somerset had won a trophy in 2000 and 2000 or 2001, the, the Cheltenham Gloucester Trophy. So we were still riding high a little bit off that. Um, and then to win another one, it was great. Well, let's just keep keep this going. That's, that was my attitude at the time. But then as time went on, you realise, wow, th- that was quite a special moment. And they don't come around that often, especially for, for Somerset. So you kind of treasure it as, as time goes on. So, But it was an amazing day, you know, at the Oval, one of my favourite grounds, when 2020 was just starting so even though it was slightly rain affected you know you had girls allowed performing at half time full house at, at the oval it was an incredible day and you'd beaten Leicestershire Paul Nixon and and his team who were one of the best uh, 20 over sides in in the semi final yeah and they should have absolutely stuffed us i think from from memory as well they uh, I can't remember the exact scores, but I remember Darren Maddy batting, and they were they were flying, and I think they they should have they should have won it quite easily, and then he got out, and then they had a collapse, and I think we ended up getting over over the line. So unexpected win, really. And some of the youngsters at the time, Carl Gazard, Wes Durston, stood up and and were counted as well. So I think Carl might have got man of the match in the semi final. Um, so it's just a, it was a, it was a great semi final, and then obviously to move through to the final. You were saying about Somerset winning trophies. Well, I'm going to move on to the the Champions League, not the football, but the uh, the cricket. Uh, and you were blast runners up in 2009, 2010, 2011, and and also in 2021. And in 2011, you played in the Champions League in India, and you reached the semi finals and played against the Mumbai Indians. That must have been an amazing experience. That was the most incredible tournament. And I know it was a bit of, I think it was a, a loss-making tournament for um, for India, I think. But it was, for a domestic player, it was absolutely amazing. You went out to India, played against these rock and roll IPL teams, against full houses over there. When you played the IPL teams, there were 30,000, 40,000 screaming fans. Uh, when you played against the other domestic, the other winners from the other countries, Australia, South Africa, that no one watched. Um, but the IPL teams, it was full. And that really felt like I imagine an international fixture would. Uh, and I would I know cricket's taken a certain direction and you know we've spoken about before there was just tournaments going on all over the place at the moment and you don't really know where to look and who to support and who's playing where. It's very complicated. But at that time cricket was quite simple in that if you won if you won your domestic T twenty trophy or came runner up in it then you got the chance to play on a global stage in a Champions League tournament. And we absolutely relished that. And they were some of the fondest memories of me playing for Somerset because it's it's amazing playing for Somerset domestically and against the, the other teams. But actually, when you can re- represent your county on a, on a global stage like we were, um, it was it was just the most amazing experience for, for myself and, and the rest of the team. We absolutely loved it. So um, I, it was a shame that that couldn't carry on I kind of understand why it doesn't especially now with everything that's going on but the idea as well I absolutely loved yeah the tournament stopped in 2014 and that Mumbai Indian side had got Kieran Pollard Harbhajan Singh Malinga and one person I was surprised to see when I looked at was Sky was playing as well for for um the Mumbai Indians okay yeah um, yeah you know Siri Kumar, Siri Kumar Yadav, um, known as Sky, who's making his test debut today. Okay, yeah. I mean, I can't even remember who played, to be honest. I remember when you play against the IPL teams, I think Virat Kohli, A.B. de Villiers, well, you, you go through them in, in different in the different tournaments and you're playing against the best cricketers in the world and it was you could just sense it was just a different level of, of cricket. And then for us, you know, small small county in, in England to get through to the semi-final and, and play the Mumbai Indians. And actually we did... We did well against the Mumbai Indians as well. I think there was a chance that we could have won that game at times. I think um, Kieran Pollard, something happened with Joss Butler, I think, and or 
Craig Kiesbetter at the time. And I think it, it kind of was a game changer. So, yeah, amazing, amazing tournament. Really kind of proud that that I got to experience that because it was so different to any of the cricket I'd previously played. Would you have liked to have played franchise cricket and travelled around the world? Yeah, if I was a youngster, you know, no responsibilities, then absolutely. What a life. I mean, you get, I, I like the idea of it. And I think definitely some people are getting that franchise fatigue a little bit at the moment in terms of just going off all over the place and then coming back in and thinking, well, I've got a whole English season to now get through as well. I think there's there's some stuff that's going to happen around that with injuries and players being fatigued and and worn out because there's a lot of workload on these guys now. So it's it's really tough. But obviously, you know, they're chasing the dollars. So there's lots of lots of money out there for them to make. And you only play cricket for a certain period of time. So they've always always got that on the back of their minds, thinking, well, I need to make the most of my 20 years at the most that I've got in the professional game. So I can't blame them for for doing what they're doing. If I was young, my head probably would have been turned turned that way because people are offering you ridiculous amounts of money to go and go abroad and go into the most incredible places and, and play a tournament for a few weeks and potentially life-changing amounts of money. It must at times, though, be quite mentally tough because in a 20-over sort of format, it's difficult when you get out of form to get back into form. Yeah, absolutely. There's so many ebbs and flows. I mean, 20-over crickets as a batter, you only really need to be performing once every three or four or five times to then get picked up in another tournament. You don't have to be as consistent as you do in, in say, the, the longer format. So actually people can can live off one innings or one eye-catching innings and can live off that for quite a while, I think, in, in 20 over cricket. But there's going to be some guys that are absolutely shattered if they're involved in Lions cricket or franchise cricket and they're going here, there and everywhere on planes traveling every all the crickets now intense it's not just going on a pre-season tour where you're playing friendlies it's it's franchise owners that want their teams to win so um i think as time goes on there's going to have to be a bit of work done around how we manage this because if they keep popping up all over the place can we expect players to be playing 12 months of the year without a break at all um but just because they're they're kind of chasing some money so yeah cricket's speeding along at a a mighty pace at the moment but i think at some point uh, the powers that be are probably gonna have to take stock and go in terms of player welfare we've just got to we've just got to have a bit of a check in here and think what is best for the players turning to the long form one one competition that somerset have always wanted to win is the the county championship and i think during your time, I think there's been runners up on, I think, five occasions. And going back to 2016, when you narrowly missed out um, to Middlesex and in the game before the Middlesex-Yorkshire game finished, you scored a century with a broken ankle against Knott. Yeah, that was, yeah. I mean, that were again, probably one of the innings I'll, I'll be remembered for, I guess. It was... Uh, just not something that happens in cricket very often, was it? I was on seven and was facing Jake Ball, six or seven at the time, I think, and Jake Ball hit me on the foot, um, which was obviously sore. And then uh, beauty of playing cricket and, and this sport is you can have you can be injured and still carry on. So managed to manage to have a runner. I had the choice of Marcus Draskothic or Tom Abel. I went for Tom Abel in the end instead of Trez. Um, and he managed to basically run 100 odd, 100 odd runs for me. And I guess it's uh, it was the freedom. Of, a lot of batting is the majority of batting is is upstairs. It's between the ears, and that was a, a case in point. Really, it was just you know it was absolute freedom. I hurt my foot. Everyone's expecting you to get out. You you don't have to move your feet. You don't have to think technically. You just think see ball, hit ball. You just think, oh, let's see how I can do here. You know, shackles are off. And it's amazing that what that freedom can do as a batter to you, really. And that was that was that day. So that's the most free. That's probably the easiest I felt batting to be during the period where you think actually he won't he won't be able to get any runs here. But it was that that enabled me to get runs, ironically. So it was that that freedom that allowed me to play the way I did. It must have been heartbreaking though watching the the other game, which I think finished the day after, didn't it? After your win. Yeah, there's been two seasons I think where we've we finished a day earlier than than uh, the other team, and so we've spent either the day in the changing room in Durham watching the TV when it was Lancashire Knots I think who were playing for 
in, in another game and watching that to see if we might win. And then the 2016 game, Middlesex Yorkshire at Lords, watching that to see what happened, what would happen in in that game. So yeah, twice that's happened where you're just watching, and unfortunately, <laughs> both times it didn't go our way. What if you could have a career where the opportunities are as vast as our nation, where it's not about mission statements but a shared mission? At U.S. Customs and Border Protection, we go beyond to protect more than borders. From ship to shore, air to ground, cities to local communities, CBP agents and officers are keeping people safe. Join U.S. Customs and Border Protection and go beyond for something far greater than yourself. Learn more at cbp.gov slash careers. Now, you played and batted with, you know, Marcus Triscothic, Justin Langer, Chris Rogers, Graham Smith. Did you learn a lot playing with all those different characters and how tough they all were? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you learn, and it's not just. I mean, I I try and learn from everyone. Really, I'm quite. I try to be quite observant and, and watch what everyone does, whether that's youngsters or or uh, experienced international players, some of the best in the game. So yeah, from from those guys, you obviously learn about work ethic. You learn about their routines, how they go about it building an inning shot selection. There's loads of things. The consistency, it, it, it often boils down to consistency, consistency in behaviours, consistency in shot selection, consistency in mentality, what they do before, during and after a game. Um, that's often what it comes down to. If young players can find uh, a consistent method that they can trust and know that it works repeatedly time and time again, then you're on to a winner, really. And you watch the best players in the world and, and what they do is the same thing over and over again because they know it works for them. So I try and pick pieces out of whether that's watching a new guy come into the team who does really well or or a senior player, international player. It's what 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 consistencies do they do that I can take into my game that allow me to potentially get a little bit more consistent in what I do? Or did. These, play- these players had a big impact on Somerset, though. Massive, yeah, all all round, not just not just on the park, but as a club, we're we're an amazing club and, and loyal supporters, and we all kind of get behind each other. So when you've got international players, some of the best players that have ever played the game coming down to Somerset, we really appreciate that and and, and take them in, and they seem to really enjoy playing for Somerset as well. A bit of a family atmosphere down here. The the, the grounds in town, so you can just wander in and out of town. Um, really, really kind of comfortable place to come and play and, and, and a lovely area surrounding us as well. But the, so the impact they had was on the wider community. Stories of Chris Gale going into, into Devon to a benefit game and, and um, having a pretty good time down there, I think. So, um, yeah, they, these guys are amazing. They seem, to, they seem to enjoy coming. Yeah, I'd forgotten about Chris Gale. Uh, uh, talking about international cricket, I mean, you played... Under 15, under 19, you captained the Lions. And I, I looked up the England under 19 team or squad that played in the semi final in, can't even remember the year now. You'll probably know it better than I will. But uh, it had had uh, Alistair Cook, Ravi Bapara, Luke Wright, Samit Patel, Tim Bresnan, Liam Plunkett all played. And yet you, you never actually made the your full debut for England. Do you regret not playing for England? I don't know, not at all. There's never a point where when squads are announced, I thought I should be in that squad. Um, yeah, I think I think maybe that's a uh, security blanket on my part as well, psychologically saying I don't have any regrets. It's obviously disappointing. You set out as a schoolboy wanting to play for England. I used to watch Test Cricket on Channel 4 and think I really want to be doing that one day. So, um, that's definitely it would definitely hang over me for the rest of my life in terms of I didn't achieve what I wanted to in, in cricket. But I'm not bitter about that. I'm not, you know, I, like I said, there was never a point where I thought I should be in that that squad. Um, I was doing better at the, at, in a few of the seasons that people were picked and, and that was fine. But I tended to peak when England were number one in the world um, and had dips when there was probably opportunities. So it's part, part on, on me as well, the fact that, um, I didn't perform exactly at the points when I needed to for for those selections. You did get on the field though in in the Ashes of two thousand and five. I, I don't know whether that's the reason why England won the Ashes in two thousand and five because <laughs> I don't know whether you, I know you got a catch against uh, 
against the Australians at Lords of Matthew Hoggard's bowl, and you caught Ricky Ponting. Yeah, caught Punner out. Yeah, so he'd been at Somerset as well. So, um, yeah, that was that was amazing experience, really. I mean, they just went around the counties. Their, their policy at the time was go around the counties, the, the ones that aren't playing, and take a couple of their better fielders to, to be 12th and 13th man for England. So it's myself and uh, my friend John Francis who played with it at Somerset. It was our chance to go and do the, the Lord's Test match. Um, so, and it was the most incredible experience because you're not you're not really part of the team, but um, they make you feel involved. Trez was obviously playing Triscothic, so I knew him from from Somerset days. But just to experience, sit there in the changing with with that team, experience the atmosphere of a full a full ground at Lords, and what ended up being one of the best Test series that, that's ever been. Being able to witness that um, it, from a changing point of view in that first Test was was incredible, and then. You know, going out to field, I went on quite a few times and myself and John did, um, just getting the call to to come on for whatever reason and, and just to be able to stand in the field at Lords for a full house wearing an England shirt uh, was an amazing experience. And then standing at backward point and hoggy bowl one to Ponting, he pushed away at one out, away from his body and it was just coming to me at point and it was amazing really because it was an easy, easy catch, but it wasn't too slow. That I had too much time to think about it, which luckily it was kind of just went in. And then I thought, then you start thinking about, you know, when you're in the change, you're thinking, oh my word, what if I drop that? So those kind of thoughts that go through your head, but luckily I didn't. And, you know, I'll forever, I will forever remember running off at Lords and being, having a standing ovation in the long room as I've taken a catch. And, you know, those, those England guys experience that all the time, but for someone that's never played, and that level to still get a little bit of that was incredible. So that was the test match when Harmy hit uh, Ricky Ponting right at the beginning of the first innings. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. I think we lost the test match, but Peterson ended up smacking McGrath, I think, into the stands a few times. An amazing, amazing game. I think Ashley Giles got a quite a cool run out as well, direct hit. So, yeah, there was loads to it. And I think it was just started bubbling then. I think people realised actually this series is going to be, this is going to be a good series. No one could foresee the incredible test matches that were going to come and how tight they were going to be and, and, and the ebbs and flows of them. But, yeah, that was an amazing part of my career, even though, you know, I wasn't officially selected. I was basically going up out, up there as a as a water boy, but still getting that that snippet of those of what was happening at Lords was incredible. Do you think that England can win the Ashes back this summer? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, definitely. I mean, obviously, Australia is such a strong team. Um, and again, if everyone's fit and the way Stokes and McCullum are, are going about Test cricket at the moment, we'll make it a, a really amazing Test series. Two top top teams. We've got some really good, exciting players coming through in in Harry Brook. So, yeah, anything can happen. The way England are going about their test cricket, they, they can beat anyone on their day. You'd like to play a bit of baseball then, would you? Yeah. Well, it's fun, isn't it? It's, uh, uh, I'm not sure I'd be quite good enough to play baseball, but it's, you know, it just it's taking the shackles off someone like a Ben Duckett who you think actually for him to play at his best, he needs that. He needs to be told, we're going to back you. We're going to give you every confidence. We've got confidence in you to go out and just play your game. He's a natural ball striker, wants to wants to naturally play quite quickly. So go and do that. And I think for someone like him, that that really helps. And you, you've even got someone like Bairstow, who because of his injury, didn't manage to play much recently. And he's coming back in and he was one of the test cricketers of the year. So yeah, so much exciting talent in that group at the moment. You must have come across Brendan during your own playing career. A little bit. I think we played New Zealand a couple of times. I think we may have played him when he played it for some of the, was it the Champions League? I'm sure I've played against him a couple of times uh, in white ball cricket uh, along the road, but not a huge amount of time. But yeah, he played his cricket in a certain way, didn't he? Incredible. So yeah, I'm, I'm loving what he's doing with the, with the test team. But you're still going to be playing cricket uh, in the summer of 2023. You're, you're going to be playing for Stony Stratford. Why Stony Stratford? Uh, that's where I'm from. So yeah, I'm a stony, stony boy, really. My parents still live there now. So sp- when you were talking about playing multiple sports, well, Stony Stratford's an amazing sporting town, really. It's got a football club, a cricket club, tennis club, croquet club, bowls club, all all next to each other, really, and quite central in Stony Stratford. And we used to live 
right next to it. So I used to go and play tennis at the cricket club and played for the football club. Um, so I used to go play tennis at the tennis club and then cricket and football at the clubs as well. So that was a great grounding for me. So Stony was my first cricket club. My dad played there. We used to, we used to go there as as kids, as babies, as pictures of me crawling up the pavilion steps as a as a toddler. So yeah, it felt quite natural to to do a full circle really, and then and then finish off my my cricket there. So yeah, looking forward to that. Excited, trying to get Stony back in up into the top league. A um, bit of a bit of a project there. There's some good guys at the club as well, and the the junior setups um, incredible with their with how many kids you're seeing there on a Friday night. And part of what I want to do is to try and get cricket, you know, increase the accessibility of cricket and the reach of cricket, and get more people playing in cricket, so playing cricket as well. So part of me going back is endorsing cricket in Milton Keynes and Stony Stratford, and trying to get as many people around that area because there's pools of talent in Milton Keynes as well that are probably untapped. Um, that need to be playing cricket as well. Will you be doing any more of your uh, medium pace bowling? I think uh, Crick Archive says you're right arm fast medium. <laughs> it should say was was a right arm fast medium when I was 18 years old. Uh, yeah, that quickly that quickly dropped off. They probably need to update that. Um, but at one point in my life, when I was about 16, I probably was right arm fast medium. And you you've also got a new role as. Um, ambassador to the somerset cricket foundation what what does that involve so the foundation is the a charity and linked to the cricket club and they do an amazing work in improving people's lives in somerset through through the medium of cricket so that's disability cricket blind cricket they also look after all the the club setups in in somerset as well so they um, and all their kind of welfare programs so it's it's a huge project really and it's amazing work they do and I think they go unrecognized at times in Somerset so to get involved in that is brilliant and attending attending events and doing whatever I can to to increase the publicity in that charity will would be great but essentially you know they just want to improve people's lives through cricket and trying to get word out that that's what they're trying to do and there's lots of opportunities for for people in in Somerset to to be playing various types of cricket walking cricket and um, table cricket so there's there's lots of projects there that people get involved with um to try and to try and get people together um create that community but use cricket as as a medium to do that some very valuable work there. Somerset does seem to be a very sort of community club, doesn't it? It is massive. Yeah, we we are a family. I still feel part of the Somerset family, even though I'm not not playing there anymore. And you, you see the work. It, Somerset cricket it stretches far wider than than Taunton and Somerset. Actually, it's it's more of a southwest club. We've got so much support in in Devon and Cornwall as well. So it's an incredible place and. And there's lots of work being done behind the scenes, not just not just it's not just the first team, although you know we would always get the kind of glory from it. But there's loads of really important work going on behind the scenes in terms of getting cricket out there to, to people in communities that might not be able to get to the ground as well. So it's 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 taking Taunton and Somerset cricket out to what out to wider communities rather than people having to, to come into Taunton as well. And yeah, it's an incredible place, an incredible club and the foundation are a huge part of that and um, so they represent they represent somerset career club as well you plan to get down to the, the county ground again this season you've got you've even got a stand named after yeah go, go sit in my stand that'd be right <laughs> yeah I, I i i can't keep away i don't think i i won't be there in any official capacity but um i'll be doing some work with the the foundation which is great but i'll be going there and just supporting the boys and Looking at them freezing cold in April, standing in the field all day. I'll be, um, yeah, I'll be sledging from the sidelines. Um, so it's great. It's 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 a community there, and people people look forward to that. Those games in the summer to go down and watch a bit of cricket and spend some time with some friends that I haven't seen since since the last summer. So just getting involved as a, as a supporter now would be would be brilliant. You could be standing in the freezing cold at Peterborough as well. So. Uh... Yeah, yeah, but that's only for one day, not four. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> and it's only an afternoon, isn't it, as well? So, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But Peterborough is a long way from here. So, yeah, no, it's um, go and stay with my parents and then go up to Peterborough, beat Peterborough, and then uh, go and have a few beers at Stony. Well, it's only up the road from me, so uh, I must come and watch. Uh, but thank you very much for joining me on the paddock and the pavilion. I'll let you get back to. Uh, reviewing those uh, tax codes as the uh, tax year draws to an end. I'm sure that will keep you busy. 
Yeah, no, thanks, Stephen. Appreciate appreciate your time. It's great, yeah. Thank you for listening to The Paddock and the Pavilion. Follow us on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram at The Pad and Pav. Don't forget, if you like the show, please do leave us a rating and review. Sports Social Podcast Network.